<laughs> All right, that was a great pickup. Man. <laughs> we just came out to film this today and uh, this is the first spot. We're actually right at the shop and uh, we're gonna do a whole video series today on how to actually catch trout on your spay rod before we did casting. And I strongly recommend you to look at the video description if this is something that you wanna, oh, that's a really, really good fish. If this is something that you wanna get into, I strongly suggest you watch that whole casting series and you actually get your rod out and follow along in your living room because it is such a great way to fish. Now I'm gonna hit a couple of highlights while I'm tiring this fish out. One, this is made for fishing on foot. You don't need a boat, you don't need a guide. It's, it's do-it-yourself angler friendly. Like this is for the do-it-yourself angler. It's a simple gear set. Can you see the fly in my hat? That's the one fly that I brought to fish this run that I might change to. I'm using heavy tippet. It's simple, I'm not gonna tangle. So if you're tired of split shot, you're tired of strike indicators and 5X and hanging your back cast in a tree, tired of all that stuff I just mentioned, this trout spay thing is probably for you. You might have to watch it twice to see how I do this, but I'm holding the line. And as I reach to net this fish, I'm gonna let that line free spool. There we go. Oh, he barely fits in the net. That's just a horse right there. Oh my gosh. Okay, there he goes. That's just a big, beautiful, wild rainbow. Oh, you're gonna catch a lot of 10 inches, a lot of 12 inches, but you're gonna feel that bite. And you're gonna have a great time doing it. It's a very efficient way to fish. It's do-it-yourself friendly. It's made to fish on foot. The tips and tactics I teach you today are gonna be useful for how to get the bites, but you've gotta do it. You've gotta get the gear. You've gotta get outside. You gotta start the car and get yourself in the river in order to succeed. Follow along and we're gonna talk through how to catch them. If you've euro nymphed or trout spayed, you've probably found it's really hard to net the fish because there's so much bend in this rod that no matter how far back here I get, it's impossible. And then the fish can just move at a perimeter and it's hard to get them in the net. So what I like to do is I like to reel them down really short, just like so. So I've got a lot of power. I've got a low rod angle going toward the fish. A low rod angle toward the fish is important. And when I go to net that fish, I can actually let go of the line with this hand. Let me loosen up the drag just a little more. So I can let go of the line, which is here, and I can let that free spool just about to the point where it's gonna backlash. It's kind of an all in, but it's gonna make the fish get landed quicker and it's gonna be a way more efficient way to get those hefty trout in your net. So one of the first questions is, <clears throat> it's an obvious one, <clears throat> like why, why spay fish? You know, I'm not throwing that far, right? So, oh, I'm throwing 30, 40 feet. The last fish I caught was 30, 40 feet. It has very little to do with distance. Um, I can cast about as far as I possibly want to cast. It's about taking a heavy sink tip and being able to quickly generate another presentation and another presentation and do it perfectly every time without snagging my back cast in those trees tying my line in knots. If you hate wind knots and casting knots, get a trout spay rod. It's so simple to be able to take and quickly throw another cast out, another cast. Again, I'll repeat, it's do-it-yourself wader friendly. If you want to fish on foot without the aid of a professional or you don't want to have to use a boat, you enjoy just hopping in the river and being able to strategically work your way downstream, spay fishing is great for that and it's productive. We can catch some very nice fish. But just in the time we've been talking here, I've gotten six really nice presentations right across the river with a sink tip that sinks at four inches per second and is 12 feet long. I mean, it's a pretty significant sink tip and it's no stress. I can just take and grid this thing. I can take it and throw it back out. Don't worry about the casting. There's another video dedicated specifically to helping you get the cast and understand the cast. But I can take that little bugger that I'm fishing right there and I can just work that thing right across this run. There was a grab right there. He just didn't hang on. And I can work that fly very methodically, almost like sonar where I'm just scanning. And now I'm gonna take and I'm gonna move down about two more feet and I'm gonna get about another foot of line off just cause my instinct tells me that I can stretch a little bit more here. I give it one mend, sinking, sinking, sinking. 
And now I'm just gonna let that thing grid across. So it's a very efficient way to fish. I don't want you looking at this going, well, there's really not much point unless you're casting country mile. There's a fish right there. Uh, it's a very methodical way to fish where if, you, if you're currently fishing, maybe you're spay fishing, maybe you're streamer fishing, and you're not having that success you were promised, uh, you know, or you thought you were gonna have when you first started out, maybe you're not being efficient enough, you know, where you're just not getting the raw number of clean presentations. But when I watch anglers fish, a spay rod versus a single hander in a piece of water like this right here that's holding some fabulous fish, the spay rod is gonna give us a lot more looks in a lot less time. An hour of spay fishing is gonna be almost twice as efficient as single-handed rod fishing. Now, there are a couple of things that you're gonna lack, you know, fishing back eddies, complex water, stripping the fly through slack water. There's a couple little, you know, advantages to single-handed streamer fishing. I get that, there's one. Uh, there's a couple of advantages to single hands. I won't deny that. But if you want something that's easy to operate in a simple gear set, this is it. I got a fly in my cap and a spool of tippet in my pocket, a net on my hip, and that's it. And I'm just gonna work my way all the way down this run. So that's some of the why we're gonna do is trout spay fishing today. And hopefully it gives you an increased understanding of why people get so excited about it is we're tired of snagging our back cast in the tree back there. We're tired of knots. We're tired of indicators. We're tired of split shot. 5X tippet and two fly rigs. Oh, there was another good grab. Okay, I'm gonna get back to concentrating on catching my trout, and then we'll talk about the next tip here in a minute. All right, so I'm in this spot, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna turn this little hook up here into just a piece of advice because I was having trouble getting strikes through here, and I'm like, man, I know these fish should be biting in here, and I know this spot. And uh, one tip I got for you is get a real net holder. I mean, this thing kind of goes in my wading belt, but <laughs> I didn't bring my sling pack today. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and net this fish. And net this guy right here. All right, cool. Not a bad little trout will take it on that nice tight line grab. Take that feller all day. Let me just get him back in the water. Yeah, I'll we'll just let him swim out. I was gonna show him off, but we'll wait till we got a lunker for that. So let's talk about casting angle. The adjustment I had to make there is I felt like my fly was probably passing over the trout in a little too high in the water column. So let's talk about casting angle. The default is we grid and we work our spay grid is 90 degrees. You can cast upstream or downstream and you can tweak that angle a little bit depending on what you need to do. If we cast a little bit more downstream, that's a great solution if we start to get a little snaggy and we're hitting the bottom because that line has less time to sink. It tightens up quicker. It's a great tool. A lot of times I'll take very fast sinking tips and I can even work shallow water uh, just because I can angle down and keep that thing tight the entire time. Inversely, if I cast upstream, it's gonna have more sink time so I can get the fly deeper. So let me share a tip uh, with you and I just call call it just finding the bottom checking the bottom see you know seeing where it's at but I'll just say occasionally I'll be guiding I'll say hey find the bottom and find the bottom to me is what I'll do is I'll cast at angles upstream so I'll cast maybe 15 degrees upstream I'll give it a nice mend and this really only works if the current that's further out is moving faster otherwise you wind up with a big belly but find the bottom to me is, okay, so I gave it lots of sink time, more than just the, night, the traditional 90 degree grid. And now if I hit the bottom here, I know that my fly is in close proximity to, to the floor, at least maybe the tops of the boulders. If I can at least get below the tops of some boulders, then my fly is more realistic when it comes out from behind the boulder. So if I didn't hit bottom there, uh, what I can do is now I can do a couple of more adjustments. I'm going to cast at about a 15 to 20 degree angle up, and I'm going to take four steps during the sink. That could also be called walking the dog. So I'm walking the dog, and now it's slowly going to tighten up, and I'm going to let it come tight right there. And now I'm going to see if I check the bottom. And what the idea is, I want to find, if I'm having trouble getting strikes, and I'm in known water that I'm very suspicious of, I just want to figure out where that threshold is of how far up I can cast without getting too snaggy and hitting the bottom too much. 
once I developed the system and I got a little tap right there and I don't think it was a fish, it didn't feel bitey enough. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cast at that same 15 to 20 degrees up. So I'm gonna launch it back up and this water is, is amenable enough to me. It's moving faster out there that I'm not getting a big belly in there. And I'm gonna take about four steps, maybe five steps. And I'm gonna keep letting it sink, 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 sink. And now it's gonna tighten up just like that. And I'm gonna figure out where that threshold is and I'm gonna make sure and flirt with that threshold. That's called finding the bottom. And I'm altering my casting angle in the, the step cadence of when I step in order to get that fly down to the depth that's either one, tap and bottom, or finally I start to get repeatable strikes of you know, every several casts I might be getting a tap. So adjust that angle accordingly. If you're snaggy, angle down. If you're having trouble getting strikes or finding the bottom, start to angle up and then step with your drift. If you're going to do that, there's the bottom right there, so I know I'm right there on it. If you are going to angle up, it is absolutely critical, 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 that you have a nice tight line cast. If you have casts where that sink tip is hitting first and that fly and leader are coming down in a pile afterwards, that's not gonna work very well. I'm gonna take three or four steps here. We're gonna really get that thing down as we finish out this run, make sure that we're sweeping it. The other thing I can do is I can give it some nice jigs. And a lot of times those nice snap jigs like this, there's a nice strike right there, man, oh man. That made my heart jump. Uh, and that fish responded to these jigs. Uh, I'm going to try that fish again here. We're going to run that real deep, just like I did. I'm not going to move my feet, but I'm going to cast it maybe even 30 degrees upstream and really give this thing some sink time. I'm going to throw a big mend into the shooting head and I'm going to reach out. I'll even choke up on the rod a little bit just to make sure I can get that mended. Running line doesn't mend very well. And now I'm going to run that through there again, and I'm going to jig it again because, man, that was a heck of a grab. Let's go. Come on. Give me one more shot at you. Okay. Adjust your angle accordingly uh, based, on, based on what I just described. Okay, real quick. When is a good time to trout spay? Um, there isn't a bad time. You know, we trout spay fish during the summer, the spring, any time that you're gonna imitate a bait fish or a swimming insect, you could trout spay fish. Uh, for the most part, it's just speaking in generalizations here, the fringe season from say mid-October in most places to mid-April, when insect activity is at a minimum, that's when we do much better on spay gear. Uh, when we're imitating small streamers, the trout don't have the same access to insects like they do during the warmer months. There's no hoppers to compete with. There's no big caddis hatches. And so these fish do become quite predatory and seek out bait fish. The other thing uh, about trout spay fishing is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about holding water later, but low water conditions for us in, in the West here is when the, the trout are holding mid-river. And for us, that's a great time for us to grid sweep the middle of that stream. When our trout are holding up under the banks and against grassy banks and technical uh, structure, that's not going to be as good. Where we excel with trout spay gear is when I can take this cast and I can sweep it right across a lot of those holding lies and cover a lot of uh, water quickly for trout that are holding offshore. So be thinking fall, winter, spring is prime time, but if you're fishing in areas where there's fish holding mid-river most of the time and a broad sweeping presentation will do it. Trout spay all year long. The reason we don't do it more during the summer months is our river runs nearly at flood stage in June, July, and August. I mean, it's bankful, so the fish are up against the shore. But right now, if you, uh, if you know a spot that looks a little bit like this, where you can grid sweep, you know, shoot a cast across, and we'll get more technical into the presentation here in a minute. But as far as the wind goes, be thinking fringe months, a warm winter day for spay fishing can be absolutely excellent. Again, we have the ability to easily and effortlessly throw very fast sinking tips and run those sink tips through the bottom half of the water column and even some of the deep pools. So fall, winter, early spring is prime time, but it can work all year long, as long as you wanna present a minnow or a swimming insect or anything that's moving. 
you know, in addition to seasonal times of year, uh, low light conditions can be really good. I mean, that's general advice for streamer fishing in general or a fish willing to chase and pursue. So dark cloudy days, uh, rainstorms, anytime there's a freshet in the river where the river maybe takes a little bump, a lot of times that will disturb the peace among bait fish. Sculpin, fry, day sticklebacks, uh, maybe even crayfish, I suppose. All that kind of stuff has to find a new home after a little bump. So low light conditions, rainstorms early and late in the day are all gonna be good times to trout spay fish where you're gonna see likely less success is gonna be in those bluebird conditions where you have sun overhead and very clear water. Likely you're not gonna see as much action on trout spay. You're probably gonna to have to dig them out with nymphs or something that uh, allows the fish to stay in their little bubble of safety down there in the bottom. With the spay gear, we're actually asking the fish to peel off and pursue a little bit. The fish get a little nervous doing that and they like to do it on cloudy, darker days, a little bit like today. All right, this tip is just going to be called the grid, and it's going to be understanding the grid and how we strategically and almost in a militant fashion start working downstream. And what we want in order to properly work a grid is we need a cast that hits with a nice tight line so that it's the same every time. Our standard MO is cast at 90 degrees. We give it a mend. It sinks and sinks and sinks. If it's easy waiting, you can take a couple of steps to make it sink well. And then I'm just gonna let that thing tighten up and let my fly start to swim all the way across, just like this. And my rod is very, very still. Nothing will annoy me more if I am guiding you or, or even fishing with you or even I see you on the river. If people are spay fishing and their rods up here or over here or over there for no reason or all over the place during one presentation. There are times we want the rod in a different position, but we're trying to accomplish very specific tasks. So we want that rod dead steady. And I'm gonna back up a, a hair so you can see my rod tip. And we want that line having very little angle change at the rod tip. If your rod is up here and then a fish bites, you're not gonna get hook penetration. It'll just pull the tip down. And then all of that line sag has the opportunity to negatively impact the presentation. So we want a very steady rod. We want to point straight down the line and that's going to be your default presentation. So in order to properly work the grid, we're, we're going to cast. Okay, I'm going to throw out at about 90. I'm going to give it a mend. It sinks, it sinks, it sinks. I'm going to wander a little bit to help it give it some sink time. And then as it tightens up, I'm gonna hold my rod out just a tiny bit and I'm gonna make that shooting head as straight as I can so that I get a nice clean presentation. And now my fly is swinging, it's on tension. That little bugger is doing its job. It's sniffing around out there trying to find the fish and it's gonna swing right in below me and I'm holding really, really still. I can even look around a little bit as long as I, my rod doesn't move. I can look at the eagle over there. I can look at the mule deer up on the bluff up there. And when it gets to the bottom, I'm now at hang down and I've completed that scan. I'm gonna go ahead and strip back in. I'm gonna make a cast off my right shoulder here so I don't injure my cameraman. And I'm gonna throw it out. I'm gonna give it a mend of just the shooting head. And again, I'm. I'm making a nice tight line cast. If your cast is sloppy, shorten up your line. I will throw rocks at you if I see you do that a couple times in a row with some sloppy crap cast out there because you are not working the grid when you're casting out there with a sloppy line. We have to have a nice tight line so that we can scan for these fish in a very methodical fashion and I don't leave anything behind. What's great about the grid is if I'm fishing with a buddy and he's coming down behind me, uh, he uh, or she could stand a little bit further out and maybe fish a little bit different fly or way to sink tip. So we work the grid from two different uh, dimensions. Okay, again, so I'm gonna work the grid. Here I go, throw my cast. And my mantra is cast, mend, swing. Not cast, mend, drift, cast, mend, swing. So I've tightened the line up and this is the, this is the most basic of, of spay presentations. It's kind of walking across. I've got a little slight belly in there. So I'm giving the fly just a tiny there. Oh, that was a good grab. That was a good grab. We'll talk about hook setting maybe in the next tip, but that one just didn't hang on. 
Um, but yeah, I jab low into the side. When you set, don't come up, come low into the side, keep that line down in the water. That'll help maintain nice, even tension. Okay, let's do her again. Let's work the grid. So just like sonar, I take a couple steps down because the water's clear. My step rate matches water clarity. If the water's dirty, I go slow, take a half a step to a step. The water's gin clear like this. I could even take four steps every time. So I'm gonna hold my rod out a, a little bit, but it's still low. Got my rod out and I'm hanging and hovering that fly right out where it needs to be. And now my rod tip is gonna follow it around just like so. So I'm swinging, 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 and I've made, you know, I'm about halfway through this swing. And this is a long swing down here because the water's moving so well. So here it goes, I'm almost to hang down. Now, when I get to the hang down, my line is hanging straight down there. So you can take a look, line straight down. I know it's hard to see in that flat light, but when the tension comes off of it, as soon as the tension's off of it, I'm gonna go ahead and take a couple strips real sharp, just like that with my rod tip down. I'm not giving up the presentation. Those first couple strips on hang down can be good. So that's the basic grid idea. We're gonna cast at 90 degrees, we're gonna give it a mend, take a couple steps if we're able to and it's safe. And then it's gonna sink, sink, sink. And then it's gonna swing, swing, swing. Now, if you keep spazzing out and setting the hook too much, here's a little bonus tip for you. Hold the rod with your, off, your opposite hand. You won't have as good reflexes doing that. <laughs> so you'll actually let them bite and get connection. I don't like to do that. It feels kind of weird, but uh, that's the grid system. So that's kind of the basis uh, for what we're going to do when it comes to all presentation adjustments is we're always thinking about that very strategic sonar-like or radar-like grid as we work downstream. Where? Where do we trout spay fish? How do we read the water? What are we looking for? The number one thing I would say on larger streams that you're going to look for is just looking at the river topographically or from kind of a macro scale. As we look back up river, we can see that there's quite a hill behind us. That river is on a pretty good grade, creating a beautiful riffle here. But the fish aren't going to cling to the hill up there, especially not when water temperatures are below 50 degrees. Maybe on a hot summer day, you, they'll be up in that shallow. But right here where I'm standing is the transition of where that hill comes and benches out and becomes a pool. And yes, we have a beautiful cliff wall there. That was intentional. But whether the cliff wall is there or not, when this river benches out and it goes from a hill to a flat, I'm going to find decelerating currents, currents that are went from very fast up here to much slower down here. That means there's a bigger volume. It's a very easy way to see where depth is. Uh, because there's more volume, the river slows down. So when you see decelerating currents, that's usually like, you know, should be your fish radar should go off. And the other thing I'm looking for is I'm looking for a relatively flat bottom. Yes, there's a cliff wall there that's a thousand feet tall, but the bottom is actually relatively uniform here. It's not just a big plunge pool. I want a flat bottom so that when I work my grid, and I'm gonna just throw a cast just for conversation here. When I throw my cast, I'm just setting up here. I cast and I mend and it sinks and it's setting up now and it's sinking, sinking, sinking. As my fly travels across, I'd like my fly to travel across on a level plane that's somewhat parallel with the bottom. So if I've got real harsh ledges or back eddies or harsh seam lines, those are areas that you would want to avoid, especially as a beginner, because your swing's not going to be clean, your line's going to go slack, you can get a little snaggy. Look for uniform currents where everything is moving at a fairly uniform speed. We're also going to look for something called standing chop. And standing chop is water that's very choppy. And it's very hard to see in the video here, but that water is very choppy out there. But when you look at it close, it's actually not moving much. So when we see standing chop or stand up chop, or I've heard it called diamond chop, when we see diamond chop or stand up chop and everything's moving, man, that's a good spot. And I really wanna find areas where I can cast slightly beyond fish and then bring my fly across the fish. I'm not gonna pluck fish off the cliff wall with my spade gear. My fly is gonna hit over there and it's gonna sweep away from the wall. What I wanna do, is I want my fly to come into this nice inside bend right here where I've got, go ahead and take a look down. I've got decelerating currents. It's not a back eddy. Everything's really moving at a nice uniform speed. 
And then even when I go to strip up my fly at the end, I'm on a nice, even, nice, even spot right there where there's no swirls, boils, whirlpools, or anything like that. Swinging flies on sink tip lines really requires a fairly uniform swing. So we're looking for to avoid back eddies, uniform currents, standing chop, decelerating currents, and we're really looking to fish at the bottom of the slope. When you see a nice hill like this from a distance, look to fish right at the bottom of that hill. You'll probably wind up with a good swing. And even if you're uh, fishing from the highway, it's really easy when you're driving up and down a river. Many rivers have a road that parallels them. Road hunting for water with spay gear is a great way to go because a lot of times looking at water from a bigger picture or a macro standpoint is more effective than being down here where everything might look fishy or everything might look the same. Don't get a fish every time doing that, but by day's end, I'll get a nice one. So here we go again, I'm gonna put it on the bar. There's a good fish. Yeah, that's what we're after right there. So what I'm gonna do is got him to the point now where I can, I can think about making a lunge with the net, but I'm gonna let my reel free spin as, so I let my reel free spin as I was reaching out with the net. That's a nice solid trout. And boy, the way he hit, oh, he just pounded it. It was, it was so awesome. But yeah, let's take a, just a nice look. Of course, the fish you get on these streamers are always just such solid, healthy specimens. Let him go. But yeah, that was great. So just to reiterate, we're, we're out here in our one person boats and I'm waiting on this bar because it's kind of hard to wade out to this spot and just letting my sink tip hit that bar and just slither right off the backside. And that's just a little unweighted sculpin. Um, unweighted flies are preferred for trout spay. So my swing is gonna come all the way down around. It's gonna come into what we call hang down. And the nature of this run is it's an inside bend and there's still a fair amount of water kind of back behind me, just the way the current peels around. So rather than just end my swing right here, I can actually recycle this. It's an old steel headers trick. It can, I can actually finish jigging it and I can pull it over and I can draw that fly into a secondary swing real quick just as I finish. So you're just basically mending it over. Um, in fact, I'm just gonna leave it on the hang down here. Instead of having my swing end, I'm now gonna mend my line over. I've got a 10 and a half foot rod so I can get a pretty good mend. And then I just jig it a few times and I let that fly work over even further into the, the water, which would almost be behind me. It's not practical for me to turn around and cast that direction right now, but I can certainly mend over and jig it and draw that streamer over. I, over the years, I've had a lot of success. It takes 10 or 15 extra seconds at the end of your swing to do that. Mend over, jig it a few times, see if you get that grab. Whatever little critter you have on the end of your line, and uh, this is just a little bugger. It could be a sculpin, it could be a little crayfish, it could be a fry, minnow. Every trout's greatest fantasy is a woolly bugger. Whatever the critter is, it had to have come from somewhere. And what we wanna do is we want to emulate this critter coming from the substrate, and that could be along the bottom, or it could be just from behind one of the bigger boulders. And, and then it's gonna take its place in the water column and start working and swimming and wandering around. So the first step to every presentation is gonna be the sink. So yes, you can spay fish with floating lines and you can throw a dry fly, I suppose, and all that. It's just not common. 90% of the time, we're gonna be throwing a sinking fly in a sink tip. So let's just throw a cast out there. And as I mend, I'm creating a sink. And I'm sinking, I'm sinking, I'm sinking, and I'm trying to get that critter at least, at least below the horizon line of the highest boulders. So, and then as it tensions, and where it comes tight during the swing is my initial rise. There are a couple of elements of the rise we wanna pay attention to. And this is something that's like really hard to video on the water and show you what happens. But as the tension of the line increases, that's your rate of rise. If the tension comes up all of a sudden, you have a very fast rate of rise. 
and that critter is going from the bottom all the way up to the top and then our bite window or the window of opportunity we have is going to be very narrow if we have an instantaneous or immediate rate of rise. The other element is the location of rise and you want to avoid a couple of things here. Uh, I see a lot of people who came from a steelhead or spay background and that's a very different you know presentation type but they just throw a whole mile and then they sink and they mend and then all of a sudden, wham, the line comes tight and their rate of rise is very quick and the, the location of rise is probably out beyond the most ideal uh, piece of water. If you are picturing yourself with a nymph or a dry fly or fishing a single-handed rod, there would probably be some areas in here or some specific spots in this run that we think are good. And to me, it's going to be just this side of that really fast riptide out there. So as I approach this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my cast a little shorter than I did before. I'm gonna mend and I'm gonna sink, 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 sink. I'm gonna mend again. And I can take my rod and I can hold the rod out just a little bit like so. And I can change the rate and location of rise by holding the rod in a very specific position or even dropping the rod tip slowly as it rises. So what I've done is I've taken that rate of rise and I've slowed that rate of rise by lowering my rod tip with the swing. It's a very dynamic strategy and it takes a bit of practice to understand how to control the rate of rise and the location of the rise. You can do so by where you stand, okay? That's like a really simple one if you're a beginner. Maybe I stand a little bit more upstream of where my fishiest location is. So now maybe even I throw a little shorter cast, I can control the length of my cast. And so now I can actually take it, I can go, okay, my fishiest area is right here. I'm gonna have a slow rate of rise by running my rod tip along with the fly. And I can even get into a sequence that's almost a half drift, half swing, really slow that rate of rise down over very specific locations. But I want this bug I want the big trout, especially the mature trout, the smart ones, the ones that have been here six or seven years, they need to understand where their food came from. And if you show them that the origin of the food was down there and then it appeared right in front of them, imagine me as a trout and this little bugger just all of a sudden flutters in up into the water column and it looks like it originated from down there. Oh man, all of a sudden I'm very apt to strike that fly even if the fly doesn't look exactly like the real food, it's sure acting like it, and I saw where it came from. Trout spay fishing isn't exactly Euronymph fishing, but Euronymph fishing, the root of why that is so effective and deadly is the trout get to see the origin of that nymph, and that nymph is down in the, in the gravel, sculpin and fry and all sorts of minnows. They don't just swim helter-skelter around in these big currents. They come from the bottom, they go from boulder to boulder, and we wanna get that fly down and control the rate of rise and the location of rise to be the most ideal spot. A really easy scenario to explain would be if I had a very specific uh, patch of chop or I could visibly see boulders out there, I would take and I would throw my cast upstream and I would dead drift it like I might any fly, and I would dead drift and I would dead drift and I would dead drift and I would control that tension so that my rate of rise and location of my rise perfectly intercepts that very specific bit of rumble chop or chop or maybe physical structure that I can see. Maybe there's even a log or something like that that's very obvious. I want that fly to drift in and then find tension and rise up in the water column right in front of those trout, lifting and hovering and tantalizing them right in the current before their very eyes. Whoa, I got one. No, I don't, I'm snagged. Uh, so you're gonna snag inevitably. And with a two-handed rod, it's a little awkward sometimes trying to get snagged. I don't really wanna walk down there because I'm gonna foul up the run and longer rods and these big shooting heads and sink tips are harder to manage. So the, the, the most common and best way to get this unsnagged is gonna be like this. So snag down here at about this angle. Okay, thought, thought it was a grab, wasn't rock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to flop my line out in the current 
just beyond the snag and I'm gonna let that head float all the way down. I can even give it a little extra line and when that floats beyond my sink tip, I'm gonna give it a nice yank and I'm gonna strip in the slack real quick. Really stress-free way to get rid of a snag. When it comes to breaking this off, you could do it a couple different ways. I could pull on it like this. I could pull on it like this. That's probably gonna snap my line back and then I still gotta get a hold of it. This is a really, like, it's gonna seem like trite, like not important, but I'm gonna pull it by hand like so, cause I've gotta either retie my fly or check my hook anyways. So now I've already got the line in my hand and I can pull it up like this. Yep, lost my fly, time for a new tippet, but at least I'm right here, ready to tie new tippet on, get this fly out of my hat. I think it's still there. Yep, fly's still there. I can rig that up, re-rig, and I'm ready to go. And I'm not fumbling around with a lot of extra line. It's neat, nice, and clean. I've got line in my hand. So setting the hook. Uh, with steelhead and salmon uh, spay fishing, you don't want to react until you get some audible noise off your reel. You can also drop a loop. We're not doing any of that with trout fishing. <laughs> it's much, much more straightforward. So you're gonna feel the grabs. You're probably gonna see your line jolt or jab first. If I'm swinging on what would be river left, my hook set, I'm gonna go ahead and react and I'm gonna set the hook with just a jab low into the side like this. I don't want this big long rod way up in the air where I've got all this slack line to, to flop around. I'm gonna lose con connectivity with the trout. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna Throw my, I'll throw my cast here just for live action. And uh, let me send one. And uh, if I could make a fish bite at will, I certainly would, but it's fly fishing, it's public water, it's real. I can't catch them at will, some days I can, but today is not that day. So I'm swinging, swinging, swinging. I've got my line uh, or my fingers on this line right here. I'm ready to pinch as I set because I don't have a super stiff drag. When I feel that grab, I'm gonna go ahead and set low into the side like this right here. Once I have that fish hooked, I'm immediately gonna go for the reel. Do not fight your fish by hand with your trout spay gear. Unless you wanna get laughed at and made fun of, don't do that. It, it turns into just a giant goat rodeo. As soon as this, you have all this running line out and I'm stripping in, and then pretty soon the trout's swimming through the running line you took something that was perfect and beautiful and then you made one giant mess out of it. So fight them off the reel. A big, large arbor reel like this is really handy because we got a high rate of retrieve. We want to fight the fish right off the reel so it's nice and clean. And then when it comes to fighting, you know, more mature fish or stronger fish, we want that nice low rod angle. We don't want this rod way up in the air. The fish will get that rod tip bouncing and that's how they can easily turn or bounce a hook out of it. We want that rod much lower like this right here. You could put this butt right uh, in your stomach right here and uh, reel it in with a much, much lower rod angle. Not with that rod way up high in the air, low and angled to the side is the appropriate way to fight fish on these very long, flexible rods. All right, so when it comes to generating strikes, there are a couple of ways, there's lots of ways, but I'm only gonna talk about two ways just based on my personal experience, is we have what's called a dead swing. And I'm really trying to hold that rod dead still and let that natural flow of the river with the chop, you know, working my line and the different speeds of current, the seams that the fly is coming across. If I have a nice soft fly with marabou and rabbit, it's gonna undulate and move nicely in the current. And that would be called just a dead swing or we call it dead sticking. So holding really steady, and the other thing I like to do is keep my fingers on the line so I can feel that bite through the line right there before it actually strikes. And it's very peaceful and it's like a jolt of lightning when that fish bites. The dead swing is just, it's a wonderful way to hook fish. It just feels great. But what I like to do is I'm working down this run and we're gonna go kind of live action here, is I'm gonna go ahead and step as I'm casting, blast it out. This is pretty shallow, so I need to angle downstream a little bit so I don't snag. Now I worked a couple dead swings and now I'm gonna work a little jig. And I'm very picky about the jig. In fact, I was guiding yesterday and I, I, I was trying to explain the jig and explain the jig. And, uh, and I, I, there's a certain tempo that you have to do that. And when I was guiding, 
I essentially had to say, let's go ahead and look at the rod tip here. I essentially had to say, if you can't do it right, don't do it at all. But when we snap jig, we're trying to put just a little parabolic hump of slack into that. So you can see my shooting head popping right there. And I'm trying to do that on a very even rhythm. And the words I used yesterday that really worked, and, and my guest started hooking fish immediately after, I said, just imagine like an EKG meter that's reading a nice even heart rate. And that heart rate is steady. It's just gonna go boom, 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 boom. And it's a very short, snappy jig. And I'm just trying to get that, that fly to puff up with water, open up a little bit, make it look like fins and tail and head are all working together. There are different ways to do it. And there's other videos that I've seen from other folks that talk about lifting the rod tip and then dropping the rod tip to introduce a smoother uh, bit of slack. Um, I've not had much success pumping the fly like this, you know, using my line hand. I don't know why it's different or looks different. I just haven't personally gotten, ne had nearly as much action doing that as I do using that tip to pop just a little tiny bit of slack in there. It's very fast. It's almost as if there was like a, a little bit of peanut butter on the rod tip and I had to flick it off there or a, a bug landed on the rod tip and I had to flick it off there. It's a very short, short pop. But what I like to do when I'm working a run like this, let's go ahead and go ahead and follow me down here. Okay, that cast, I shanked that one. I'm gonna reload. I get a mulligan there. Okay, that's a much better shot. I don't catch many fish unless my line lands very nice. It's so important that you work on your cast. Very, very important that you work on your cast. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop this one through, look at the rod tip here. I know the light's really flat, but you can see I'm just popping it. Rainbow trout especially like very predictable prey. Rainbow trout aren't really chase predators they're ambush predators. They like to see it coming and then they like to make a plan to grab that bug. So I dead swung that one, or excuse me, I twitched, I, I did a twitch pop on that one and now I'm just gonna dead swing. And so I'm gonna alternate, dead swing, twitch pop, dead swing, twitch pop. And eventually I'm gonna find a pattern that the fish seem to like more than others. And today it's been a it's been about 50-50, but there are some days when it's like 80-20, 80% 80 of it might be dead swing or 80% of it might be twitch pop. So there are things that you can do to create action. I would just strongly suggest that you find ways to do them very consistently and make that fly swim in a very predictable and consistent fashion as it's tracking across the river. So. Twitch pop, dead swing, twitch pop, dead swing. If I start getting more bites on one versus the other, I'll finish the run or finish the day with just that one presentation strategy.